What is the biggest thing in the universe? In 1985, cosmologists believed that they had found the answer. A team led by John Huckra at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics had just completed a survey of thousands of galaxies in the direction of the constellation Coma Berenices. But as they looked through the results, they noticed something odd. Stretched across hundreds of millions of light years, a shape began to slowly appear. The shape of a person. A stick man. But the creature with a long, slender torso, outstretched arms, and dancing legs, was no monster of ancient legend. It was one of our first glimpses of a supercluster. And it was not alone. Our observable universe turned out to be full of superclusters, roughly 10 million in total, each one containing tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Indeed, our own Milky Way is nestled inside of one, known as Laniakea, on one of its outer limbs. And these superclusters are massive. At their smallest, they are several hundred million light-years long, composed of lacing, entwined branches, and clumps of galaxies. The largest stretch across the heavens for up to 10 billion light-years, and their enormous volume is matched only by their mass. A typical supercluster can hold over 10 million billion suns worth of material. The nearest superclusters are named simply for the constellation we have to peer through to map them. The Coma, the Virgo, the Hydra Centaurus, the Pavowindus. More distant ones are usually given simple catalogue designations, unless they break some record in size or distance. For example, the King Ghidorah supercluster, one of the most massive yet mapped, was discovered in 2022 by a team of Japanese scientists who named it after the three-headed nemesis of Godzilla. Despite the monstrous size of these superclusters, their ability to encompass hundreds of thousands of galaxies at once, the way they bridge across light years with strings of dazzling points, they are small. For there is a far larger, far more menacing class of entity inhabiting our cosmos. The true largest objects in the universe are nothing. These are no titans of ancient myth or kaijus of modern cinema. They are the opposite, the shadow in the dark. For most of our universe is void, nothingness. There are no lights to trace their structure, no gaseous filament to highlight their nature. We can only detect them through their absence. The cosmic voids are the single largest objects in the universe. They define the superclusters, they define our existence. Everything we know and love, our home solar system, our galaxy, our supercluster, all exist suspended on the edge of the abyss. And they are the ultimate destiny of everything in the universe. The first universe simulations run on computers were in the 1960s. N-body simulations, able to simulate about 100 bodies at a time. A far cry from the recent Flamingo universe simulation with 300 billion elements. And certainly not powerful enough to run Opera, our sponsor today. The faster, safer, and smarter choice than any of the default browsers out there. Opera has a great, intuitive design, with things like ARIA, a state-of-the-art generative AI created in collaboration with OpenAI. It is easily accessible and offers options to explain, explore, and translate any highlighted text on a page, very handy when you're looking through physics papers. It also has integrated messaging systems for WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and more, a free inbuilt VPN and ad blocker, and most importantly for me, great little tab islands for when I've gone down a rabbit hole on a scientific theory and want to have lots of online books or documents open at once. It's an effective and secure browser option that those scientists in the 1960s would have loved to get their hands on. So click on the link in the description below to download Opera. It's free and you won't be disappointed. Thanks to Opera for supporting educational content on YouTube.
The year was 1978, and astronomers Laird Thompson and Stephen Gregory had set themselves an exhausting task. Staying up all night for nearly a week at the Kitt Peak Observatory, located southeast of Tucson, Arizona, they were painstakingly recording the positions of dozens of galaxies. After confirming the positions of these galaxies on the sky, they then fed the light from their telescope into a simple tube that electronically amplified it. The forerunner of the modern-day digital camera, this technology allowed them to access exceptionally dim and distant galaxies, far greater than the reach they could normally get. They were peering further into the universe than any astronomer had before. Once amplified, they then passed the light from the galaxy into a spectrometer, and from there, Thompson and Gregory could measure the redshift of the galaxies, using that to work out the distance. There were no computers, no sophisticated algorithms, no automation. Thompson and Gregory were performing a survey of galaxies by manually recording their positions and distances. Of course, they were not the first to perform such a task. Astronomers had been carefully mapping galaxy positions for decades. But Thompson and Gregory had two tricks up their sleeves, two techniques previously unapplied to cosmology. One was their use of light amplification, but their second trick wasn't one of technology or theory or even deep insight. It was a plot a method of displaying the positions of their newfound galaxies. The plot looked like a slice of pizza, putting the Earth at the pointy apex and broadening outwards as the distances from the Earth grew. Though the idea may not seem important, it was revolutionary, because it allowed Thompson and Gregory to place the large scales of the universe in context, condensing the information into an easily digestible format. The plan for their survey was to map the galaxies in and around the Coma Cluster, known for decades as a dense agglomeration of galaxies. They hoped to use their results to find differences between galaxies that were members of the cluster and those that were in the field, the random scattering of galaxies thought to be strewn about the universe. But instead, they found something else. A vast, empty region, devoid of any galaxies. A patch millions of light years wide that should have been full of galaxies, but wasn't. A flaw in the cosmos. Their new technique for plotting the positions of galaxies made it too obvious to ignore. A dense collection of black dots represent the coma cluster, a smattering of dots here and there surrounding it, and in the middle, nothing. And so they gave a name to this blank space. A void. When Thompson and Gregory published their work, the astronomical community was skeptical, and sometimes outright hostile. We've already taken the measure of the heavens, they argued, and galaxies inhabited the whole of the cosmos. The pair of astronomers had clearly made a mistake. Perhaps they had some flaw in the design of their survey, or maybe their eyes were simply deceiving them. They wanted to see a void, where there was none, driven by their desire to make a dramatic discovery. No matter what, nature abhors a vacuum, and the void that they discovered should not and could not exist. But that was in Europe and America. For mere months after Thompson and Gregory released their results, a trio of Estonian and Soviet astronomers and theorists published the results of their own survey in a different direction of the sky. Though their survey did not use the pizza-shaped diagram, they noted the existence of large holes in the distribution of galaxies. And on top of this, in contrast to the Western view of cosmology, Soviet-led scientists had been deliberately looking for such structures. In the West, the dominant paradigm of the large-scale structure of the universe simply could not admit the existence of voids. Cosmological theory held that the universe was homogeneous, meaning that it was, on average, roughly the same from place to place at large enough scales. The particular pattern of galaxies might be different here and there, but statistically, everything was the same. Astronomers had known about the existence of clusters for some time, but these were just denser-than-average lumps in an otherwise random distribution of galaxies. For Americans and Europeans, voids simply didn't fit. But the Estonian and Soviet astronomers had a different view. 
In the USSR, the great theorist Yakov Zeldovich had developed an entirely different proposal for the evolution of structure in the universe, hypothesizing that large collections of material fracture and splinter off, over time forming ever smaller clumps like clusters and then galaxies. In this picture, voids naturally appear as a consequence of this continued fragmenting of the cosmos. And so it wasn't until 1981 when American astronomer Robert Kirshner led another survey in a completely different direction of the sky that the Western astronomical community began to accept the reality of the void. Kirshner and his colleagues found what is now known as the Bootes Void, which still remains as one of the largest known voids in existence. The Bootes Void was larger than any galaxy, larger than any cluster, larger than anything. In the survey volume, the Bootes Void was the largest single object in existence, a vast expanse of emptiness dominating the heavens. Together with the Coma Void, which the original void discovered by Thomson and Gregory came to be known as, astronomers were forced to accept their existence. But this raised big questions. First of all, very simply, how the voids could exist, and more importantly, how could a homogeneous universe permit such a blemish? This was the birth of the study of the large-scale structure of the universe, and the discovery of the first voids ushered in our understanding of the true scope of our cosmos. The universe was not, as cosmologists had previously suspected, an endless series of galaxies occasionally clumped into clusters. Instead, it was far more elegant. The clusters were there, but they were only nodes, dense knots caught in the tangle of long, thin filaments of galaxies. Between them hung gigantic sheets, walls of galaxies beyond the scale of human imagination. And dwarfing them all were the voids, the expanses of nothingness that at first defied, but then defined the large-scale structure of the universe. But of course, these voids demanded explanation. What became increasingly clear in the 1980s and 1990s was that the universe could still be homogeneous, but only on truly enormous scales. Clusters did not represent the end of greatness. Even the smallest cosmic voids utterly dwarfed them. They defined and outlined a far vaster structure, one that subsumed the entire observable universe. And mapping that greater structure, the voids and clusters together, led to an even greater challenge finding an explanation for its existence. As cosmologists worked, they would discover void after void, and with each new generation of survey, they would find vast expanses of emptiness to rival and even surpass the greatness of the Bootes and Coma voids. And each time they found a new, gigantic cosmic void, they would be forced to ask if this was truly the end. Would homogeneity, a scale at which the universe was the same everywhere, ever be found. We do not know who made the Lennox Globe, but we do know when it was constructed. 1510, less than two decades after Columbus made contact between the old and new worlds. The globe features roughly accurate coastlines for Europe, Africa and Asia, although the proportions are grossly distorted by modern standards. South America is present, though only its southern half. North America is a series of large islands, and there is no trace of Australia or Antarctica. But along the eastern coast of Asia, which at the time was known partly through second-hand accounts of sailors, is written the Latin phrase, Ic sunt dracones. Here be dragons. The globe is one of only two known maps to actually contain the phrase, but the sentiment reached far and wide in medieval map-making. At the time, the world was just beginning to open up to discovery, trade and conquest. Geographers were learning more and more about the structure of the world with every voyage. But for every measurement and survey of a coastline or location of a city, much remained unknown. 
And so these early map makers faced a difficult decision. What should they put in those blank spaces? The answer was simple. Fantastical illustrations of dragons, serpents, lions, and other dangerous creatures to create a sense of wonder and mystery of the unknown lands of the world, and to warn the viewer that beyond the lights of civilization lay hidden dangers. But that sense of lurking danger, of the unknown in the dark, did not die with the mapmakers of the Age of Exploration. As astronomers continued to pierce farther into the heavens, they would also find empty places and boundaries of their knowledge. Our maps of the local universe begin with the known, the named, the safe. Our solar system, a single star surrounded by eight planets and innumerable smaller objects, is but one of hundreds of billions inhabiting our home, the Milky Way. This galaxy, with its serenely spiraling arms and dense core, spans a hundred thousand light years in diameter, though it's less than thirty thousand light years thick. Compared to that, even the greatest possible extent of our solar system is at the same scale as a single microscopic cell compared to an entire human body. Sitting roughly two and a half million light years away from us is our nearest major neighbor galaxy, the Andromeda, which contains up to a trillion individual stars, also gleaming brightly in a beautiful spiral pattern. Together with Triangulum and a scattering of other dwarf galaxies, we form the Local Group. It's a rather uncreative name, but it's fitting. It's a small group of galaxies bound together through their mutual gravitational attraction. Whatever fate befalls the universe, we will remain by each other's side. The next nearest major cosmological object to us is a cluster, specifically the Virgo, named after the constellation you must look through to observe it. Clusters are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the cosmos. They are dense cities, homes to a thousand or more galaxies, sometimes spanning millions of light years in diameter. The Virgo Cluster sits roughly 65 million light years away from us, and it's at these scales that we truly enter into cosmological considerations. The Virgo Cluster sits as the centerpiece of what's known as a supercluster, the largest agglomeration of matter in the entire universe. Though they are not yet gravitationally bound, meaning that the mutual self-gravity of all the galaxies within them have not completely pulled them together, superclusters are still forming. The name for our local supercluster is the Virgo Supercluster, which is an unfortunate bit of duplicated astronomy terminology. The Virgo Cluster beats at the heart of the Virgo Supercluster, which is home to dozens of groups, just like our local group. However, more recently, astronomers have discovered that the Virgo Supercluster is just one branch of an even larger supercluster. Named Laniakea, taken from the Hawaiian word for immense heaven. The name is appropriate because Laniakea contains four branches, each large enough to count as a supercluster in their own right. Up to 500 individual groups and clusters, and over 100,000 individual galaxies, all forming a tangled, branching, reaching mass, stretching over half a billion light years. The scale of Laniakea compared to a single galaxy is roughly the same as the scale of a city compared to a person. But considering that each galaxy has tens, if not hundreds of billions of individual stars, you can consider Laniakea as a truly great metropolis, the equivalent of an immense city housing quadrillions of people, its star count roughly equivalent to the number of ants that inhabit the Earth. And Laniakea is not alone. Beyond our home supercluster sit even more, the Hercules supercluster, the Shapley supercluster, the Perseus Pisces, Beyond that, the sheer number of known superclusters outpaces our ability to give them individual names, and so they are known simply as numerical entries on a computer catalog, recordings of their position in space, and lists of their member galaxies. Taken together, all the interconnected superclusters create the cosmic web the largest structure 
in the entire universe. Every corner of the observable cosmos with a diameter of 95 billion light years is filled with this series of supercluster connected to supercluster, a network of galaxies traversing the known universe. Where the tangled branches meet, massive clusters like Virgo appear, with long, thin filaments stretching between them and broad walls sectioning off entire portions of the cosmos. The size of the cosmic web is almost impossible to describe by analogy. You could say that galaxies are compared to the cosmic web the same way that individual cells are compared to the human body. But for this to truly work, our cells would have to be a million times smaller than they are in reality. The cosmic web is simply so vast, so large, that individual galaxies appear as nothing more than tiny dots of light. Each galaxy home to hundreds of billions of individual stars stretched across a hundred thousand light years. But as dazzling and incomprehensibly vast as these superclusters are, they are almost inconsequential to the grand tapestry of our universe. Instead, by volume, the cosmos is almost entirely void. All galaxies, with the exception of the ones buried deep within the hearts of clusters, live constantly on the edge, never far from the vast gulfs of relative nothingness that consume the universe. And so, in this sense, the name Cosmic Web is apt. Just as the threads of a spider's web also draw the eye but take up almost no space, so too does the light of galaxy after galaxy light up the filaments and clusters, and yet are dwarfed into nothingness by the nothingness between. Astronomers find it difficult to map the voids closest to us, since they are so big and so empty that they require broad, comprehensive surveys to reveal them. But we do know that the nearest void to the Milky Way is the local void which by itself is nearly 200 million light-years across. Beyond that, we have the northern and southern voids, the giant void, and the Bootes and Coma voids. Beyond them, as cosmological surveys continue to push deeper into the universe, sit even more. Empty spaces arranged raggedly between and among the superclusters. And yet, despite their names, each void is not perfectly empty. They certainly lack galaxies, as the early astronomers found to their amazement. But there are innumerable microscopic objects floating through the cosmos. Bits of hydrogen and helium, cosmic rays and neutrinos blasting here and there, and the ever-present radiation from the cosmic microwave background. But the density of matter within a void is definitely extremely low. Cosmologists typically define a cosmic void as any region of the universe with a density lower than 20% of the cosmic average. And considering that the cosmic average is roughly one hydrogen atom per cubic meter of space, that's very low. In contrast, a galaxy will have at minimum millions of times greater density than the cosmic average. And so this means that deep within the hearts of voids, aside from the occasional stray hydrogen atom or passing cosmic ray, you can find yourself millions of light years away from any significant structure, galaxy, or even star. They are by far the loneliest places in the universe. Indeed, these voids aren't just empty of matter, they are also empty of dark matter. Dark matter makes up over 80% of the mass of almost every single galaxy and cluster in the cosmos, even though it is completely invisible and made of some particle unknown to modern physics. And this dominance of dark matter extends to the filaments and walls of the cosmic web itself. What we see in the galaxies are just the bright lighthouses on a distant, dark shore, giving us faint glimpses into the true structures beneath. And so the cosmic web is made of dark matter, and in turn, the cosmic voids are empty of dark matter. 
Although we cannot directly observe the distribution of dark matter in observations, because we're limited to observing the light-emitting galaxies, we can see the full glory of the dark matter cosmic web in cosmological simulations. The densest concentrations of dark matter correspond to the appearance of clusters, while threads of dark matter contain filaments of galaxies. And where there's no dark matter, deep in the greatest of cosmic voids, there are also no galaxies. Galaxy surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey have discovered tens of thousands of voids in the universe, and even that represents only a tiny fraction of the observable cosmos. The smallest voids are roughly 20 million light-years in diameter, and astronomers find them embedded inside of much larger accumulations of matter, relatively tiny, empty pockets buried within superclusters. Whereas the largest voids stretch across significant fractions of the known universe, separating their boundary superclusters by a billion light-years and more. And it's in these enormous voids that we find the beginnings of a potential problem. The voids are big and empty, which was a surprise to early astronomers, but we do now have an understanding of how they, along with the brightly lit superclusters, formed over the course of billions of years of cosmic history. But some observations suggest that the very largest voids may be a little too large, that they break our understanding of cosmology, that they shouldn't belong in the universe. These are the so-called supervoids. The entrance was in the bottom corner of a sinkhole, completely covered from above. Stumbled upon completely by accident, the cave was discovered by a local Vietnamese logger searching for wood near the border with Lao. Hearing the sound of rushing water, his curiosity drew him within the entrance. It was pitch black, but judging by the feel of the air, I thought I was walking into a huge space. The strong wind blowing felt like something from the underworld. He returned home, forgetting the exact location of the entrance, not finding it again until 20 years later, in 2008. The next year, Ho Hain guided the British Cave Research Association into the cave, and multiple expeditions over the course of years finally revealed the full extent of the system, which stretched for nearly 10 kilometers. The cave, called Sun Dong, which roughly translates as Cave of the Mountain River, is the largest in the world. It even has its own ecosystem and weather, and it spent millions of years hiding in plain sight, undisturbed. Our world is full of hidden wonders, empty spaces lingering undiscovered right beneath our feet and above our heads. So what else are we missing in the universe? What caves, what empty spaces lurk in the vast reaches of the cosmos? And what do these cosmic caves teach us? The voids and supervoids are there, between and among the great structures of the universe, and we've only just begun to explore their terrible depths. But despite their enormous, universe-dominating size, these voids have not always been this large. Just like their counterparts, the walls, filaments and clusters, the voids began their lives as subatomic fluctuations in the quantum foam that permeates all of space and time. These fluctuations were briefly frozen in place during the tumultuous epoch of inflation, that hypothesized event which cosmologists suspect occurred well before our universe was even one second old, increased the size of the cosmos by multiple orders of magnitude. In the process, subatomic variations in space-time enlarged drastically to become very small variations in space-time. But what came after is all due to gravity. These tiny pockets of curved space-time had slightly stronger gravitational attraction, which allowed matter to begin pooling in them. As matter piled together, those clumps had an even stronger gravitational pull, which in turn increased their ability to pull in even more matter from their surroundings. Like a cave that starts as a small stream of water carving a space for itself in the crust, 
Over the next hundreds of millions of years, the slow but persistent machinations of the gravitational force would begin the process of building the cosmic web. The first stars gathering to alight the first galaxies, the first galaxies assembling into the first groups, the beginnings of the wisp-thin tendrils of the filaments connecting them, sending more material funneling into the initial massive clusters. But in our universe, when the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. As matter continued to accumulate onto the galaxies and groups and clusters, it had to come from somewhere. And it came from the voids. Starting their lives as one part per million depressions in density, scarcely noticeable from any other patch of the universe, the voids emptied out and enlarged. Compared to the massive structures, which built themselves up from violent collisions and furious mergers, the early voids led quiet, placid lives. They simply got bigger. Matter poured out of them and into their surroundings, at first slowly, then at a quicker pace as the gravitational attraction of the cosmic web grew larger. Over the same hundreds of millions of years that saw the emergence of the first stars and galaxies, the first voids also appeared in tandem, beginning as tiny forgotten pockets and steadily increasing their volume until they quickly dominated the cosmic web. Voids occasionally merge, just as galaxies and clusters do, but when voids come together, it is a much less violent affair. If a wall of galaxies separates two voids, for example, then over time, the galaxies and matter in that wall slowly disperse, making their way to the dense clusters on the perimeter of the wall. When enough material leaves the wall, the two voids become a single, larger entity. No titanic collision, no great release of energy, just the inexorable expansion of nothing. This kind of flexibility made it difficult for cosmologists to precisely define a void. But recently, they have come up with a unique solution, one inspired by a completely different field of study. Geography. Geographers often want to identify the sources and flows of water on a landmass. Discovering the path of water aids in understanding ecosystems, mapping and mitigating the effects of pollution, and measuring the availability of groundwater for drinking, irrigation, and industry. To do this, geographers create a map known as a watershed. A watershed is a region where all the water flows to the same destination. Watersheds are typically divided by high topographical features, like mountains and ridges. If you imagine pouring rainwater over the continental United States, for example, you'll find some water flowing towards the Pacific and some water flowing towards the Atlantic. The Rocky Mountains serve as the ridgeline between these two different watershed regions. And so if we imagine the high-density regions of the universe, like walls and filaments, as high-peaked mountains, and the low-density voids as the valleys between them, we can perform a similar kind of analysis. If we imagine pouring water throughout the universe, allowing that water to run from the heights of the filaments and walls and into the valleys of the voids, this watershed technique provides cosmologists with a clear, cohesive definition of a void. They are simply the low-density regions of the universe defined by their surrounding topology, just as the watersheds on a landmass are defined by the mountain peaks and ridges that surround them and determine where water flows. Using this technique, cosmologists have been able to leverage existing galaxy surveys, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey, to map and catalogue tens of thousands of individual voids in the nearby universe. And in those surveys, cosmologists have begun to identify a hierarchy of voids. The largest voids in the universe are not completely empty. Instead, they contain small collections of dim, red galaxies. And those galaxies are not scattered about randomly inside the voids. Deeper analysis has revealed that those galaxies, as feeble as they are, arrange themselves into a cosmic web in miniature, with small groups and thin, tenuous filaments. And sitting between those tenuous filaments are voids unto themselves, 
nestled within the volume of the greater voids. Imagine a gigantic cave system with a main chamber leading to smaller empty spaces divided by thin walls of rock. That is what cosmologists are finding in the cosmic web. And analysis of voids in simulations of the cosmic web reveal even deeper levels, with sub-subvoids nestled inside of subvoids nestled inside of voids. Indeed, the structure of voids in the universe is fractal-like in nature, with the same cosmic web structure appearing again and again from smaller to larger scales. However, we cannot directly observe all the levels of this nested hierarchy because the cosmic web mostly exists in dark matter, with only a portion of it illuminated with galaxies. But where does that fractal-like hierarchy stop? Are the largest known voids, like the Boötes void, the largest possible voids in existence? Or are they mere subvoids of even larger expanses of emptiness? The supervoids. One hint at the existence of supervoids comes from an unexpected source, the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. The CMB is the leftover light generated when our universe was only 380,000 years old. At that time, the universe was a million times smaller than it is today, and had an average temperature of around 10,000 Kelvin, forcing all the matter in the cosmos into a state of a high-density, high-temperature plasma. As the universe expanded from that state, the plasma cooled, becoming a neutral gas, and the first atoms appeared. This process also made the universe transparent to radiation, and that radiation flooded the young cosmos, persisting to the present day as a bath of low-energy microwave radiation. The CMB isn't perfectly smooth, as it contains one part in a million variations in temperature, cooler and hotter spots of various sizes. Cosmologists understand the statistics of these spots, both their size and their temperature, and use them to glean an enormous amount of information about the state of the young universe. Except one. Known simply as the cold spot, a particular region of the CMB is both exceptionally large and exceptionally cold. In fact, it's so large and so cold that standard cosmological models could not account for it. It is an anomaly. There is to date no widely accepted explanation for this cold spot, and theories have ranged from radical changes to our cosmological models to the tantalizing possibility that the cold spot is the intersection point of our universe with another. But the most likely explanation is that when we look at the cold spot, we're really just looking at a vast, shallow combination of voids. A supervoid. The supervoid can affect our view of the CMB because of the fact it has not always been here. It took time for the supervoid to evolve out of the primordial cosmic web. When light from the CMB first entered the supervoid long ago, it was relatively small and shallow. But the supervoid is so big that it took hundreds of millions, even billions of years to make the crossing. In that time, the supervoid widened and deepened. And so when the light finally made its way out of the other end, it found itself having to overcome a much deeper gravitational well than when it entered. This sapped energy from the CMB light, resulting in a cold spot in that direction. And the cold spot supervoid, also known as the Eridanus supervoid, is not alone. Another supervoid, the Carnes Venatici supervoid, also known simply as the giant void, sits over one and a half billion light years away, but stretches across a vast 1.3 billion light years diameter. But largest of all, in 2013, a trio of researchers, Ryan Keenan, Amy Barger, and Lennox Cowie, proposed the existence of a truly enormous supervoid. This void, known occasionally as the KBC void after its discoverers, or the Great Hole, would be the largest void ever known, potentially up to 3 billion light years in diameter. On top of this, despite all the large structures surrounding the Milky Way galaxy, like the Laniakea and Shapley superclusters, 
This super void would contain them all, with its volume so large that it could contain all these structures and still have an average density low enough to be called a void. The trio of astronomers proposed the existence of this supervoid to help explain discrepancies in the measurement of the Hubble constant, which is the present-day expansion rate of the universe. Measurements taken from the early universe, like the CMB, differ from measurements taken in the modern universe, like with supernovae. Since the interiors of voids and supervoids have different rates of expansion, the KBC void, with its enormous volume surrounding us, could explain the difference. However, the existence of the KBC void remains highly disputed, as astronomers have not found additional, independent evidence for its existence. Regardless of the existence of the disputed KBC void, the other known supervoids stretch, if not outright break, our understanding of cosmology. Like a cave that could never have formed in geologic timescales given our knowledge of cave formation processes, the problem is that voids may simply be too big. We understand the scale where the universe becomes homogeneous as a product of gravity and time. We know what the early universe was like because we have highly detailed maps of the size of matter fluctuations thanks to our observations of the CMB. From there, we can take our understanding of how gravity works and the fundamental components of the universe to trace out the ensuing evolution of the cosmic web. And the results of those calculations tell us that if we zoom out to scales of 300 million light years, the universe should be roughly the same from place to place. In other words, one 300 million light year patch of the universe should be the same, at least in a statistical sense, as any other. 300 million light year patch. To get a better sense of what homogeneity means in this context, imagine taking a square patch of land and measuring how many people live within that patch. Obviously, people are not spread homogeneously across the earth. There are far more people crowded into dense cities, far fewer in the rural outskirts, and almost nobody in deserts. If your patch is too small, say 100 kilometers across, then your patches will be very different. Some will capture nothing but inhospitable desert or mountain ranges, while others may be centered on bustling cities. But if you make your patch big enough, then every patch will at least get some cities, many rural areas, and broad areas of uninhabited regions. That is the homogeneity scale, where every patch has roughly the same average population. And so the presence of the largest voids potentially threatens our understanding of cosmology because they are like vast deserts that stretch farther than even our biggest plausible patch. The largest supervoids are larger than the purported scale where the universe should become homogeneous. And so the question becomes, are these supervoids just randomly large, through sheer cosmic accident and don't otherwise affect our understanding of homogeneity, or are they so big that we need to revise our understanding of how large structures appear and grow in the cosmos? If a cave on the Earth is too big and too deep, it starts to threaten our understanding of geology. There is no firm answer within the cosmological community to this question. Some cosmologists argue that the known supervoids are far too large and violate our current understanding of homogeneity and therefore force us to reconsider our cosmological models. Perhaps a new fifth force of nature or some new element in the cosmos explains how the supervoids have grown so massive. But at the same time, other cosmologists argue that we should expect the occasional supervoid, even in our nearby patch of the universe, based on results from extremely complex computer simulations of the growth of structure. While there remains no resolution to this debate, one thing is clear. The voids have not stopped growing. They emerged billions of years ago as tiny pockets of low density embedded in a sea of matter. They have grown to their present scale, where they dominate the volume of the universe. And over the next few billion years, they will come to rip apart the cosmic web and leave nothing but darkness behind.
there are many dangers lurking in the cosmos. Many processes whose sole desire is to grow, expand, and consume. Simple diseases like viruses and bacteria are limited in their growth by the resources available in the biosphere and competition with other organisms. But on the very largest scales, there is nothing that can stand in the way of all-consuming multiplication. The cosmic voids are more than mere empty holes in the distribution of matter in the universe. They were once much smaller than they are today, they're not done growing, and in a strange trick of physics, there is nothing that can ever stop them. We live in an expanding universe. With every passing day, our cosmos grows larger and larger. Another way to state this is to say that the average distance between galaxies grows with time. There may be occasional mergers here and there. For example, the Milky Way galaxy will merge with Andromeda in roughly 5 billion years. But at large enough scales, this expansion becomes apparent. And in the late 1990s, astronomers discovered that this expansion is accelerating. The expansion of the universe is getting faster and faster every day. Even to this day, nobody knows for sure what's causing this accelerated expansion. But it does have an appropriately mysterious name. Dark Energy In the simplest and most straightforward models of what dark energy could be, physicists treat it as a fundamental aspect of the vacuum of space-time itself. This means that if you were to take a box and empty out all the particles and the radiation, leaving behind a perfectly empty volume, you would still have a box filled with dark energy. This dark energy has an extremely weak repulsive gravitational effect, which means we can't notice the effects of it where there are large concentrations of mass, like galaxies and clusters, but averaged across the entire universe, it becomes dominant, causing the universe's expansion to accelerate. And this means that there is only one place in the universe where dark energy dominates. The cosmic voids. The deep depths of vast emptiness that define the nature of these voids means that they are not truly empty. They are indeed void of matter and radiation, but they are filled to the brim with dark energy, a disease that is infecting the universe. It is within the voids, not the galaxies, not the filaments, not the clusters, where the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And the cosmic voids aren't just blandly expanding as matter accumulates around their edges. Because of dark energy, they are literally pushing on their borders, driving more and more matter away from their centers. They are pressing on the walls between them, thinning them out. They are squeezing on the filaments, breaking them apart. And this will not stop. In fact, it will get worse. As the universe expands and the voids grow larger, there will be even more dark energy in the universe, allowing dark energy to become more powerful. Dark energy first began to dominate the evolution of the universe about 5 billion years ago. It was in that era that the grand story of structure formation in the cosmos, from the humble seeds planted in the first chaotic moments of inflation, to the spinning of the grandest structures in the universe, began to come to an end. A subtle symptom that something was deeply sick in the cosmos. This means that the great superclusters that stretch and wind and twist for hundreds of millions of light years will never truly come together. The voids surrounding them will crush them to death, breaking the tenuous bonds between the clusters and driving all matter as far away from itself as it possibly can. In only a few billion years, the cosmic web will be destroyed, consumed by the ever-growing voids within it. No more filaments, no more superclusters, no more walls. Only isolated groups and clusters, separated by an ever-increasing, vast expanse of absolute nothingness. Of voidness. The far distant future of the universe belongs to the void. They will win. They will leave nothing behind as they ravage the universe. But in an ironic twist, 
Voids are humanity's most crystal clear windows into the deepest layers of the past. When cosmologists try to understand the universe, they only have two choices. One choice is to search for direct observational evidence from specific epochs, like the cosmic microwave background. But the CMB is fundamentally limited. It was a singular event that happened only once, briefly, in the entire history of the cosmos, and so it only carries so much information with it. Whereas the other choice cosmologists have is to observe as much of the modern-day universe as possible, building maps of the distribution of galaxies, groups, clusters, and voids, and use those maps, combined with our knowledge of physics, to rewind the clock and try to learn what the universe is made of. The contents of the universe, the amount of normal matter, dark matter, and dark energy, determine how the cosmic web evolves. A universe with much larger strengths of dark energy, for example, would have never formed a cosmic web in the first place, while a universe with too little dark matter would have only formed weak and feeble galaxies. The story of the entire history of the universe is written in the cosmic web, a vast treasure trove of data that can tell us what the universe is made of, how it evolved over billions of years, and what its ultimate fate will be. But the cosmic web is enormously complex. In principle, we can rewind the evolution of every cluster and every galaxy back to the primordial soup of hydrogen and helium billions of years ago. After all, it's just a bunch of particles interacting with each other through the fundamental laws of physics. But in practice, this is nearly impossible. For example, your body contains trillions upon trillions of hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms have inhabited the cosmos for over 13 billion years. The properties of those same hydrogen atoms, their positions, their velocities, their particular combinations and arrangements inside your body, contain some faint memory of the universe as it was all those billions of years ago. But discovering those early conditions by examining your body would entail figuring out every single interaction that those hydrogen atoms participated in during all those billions of years. So even though there is an echo of the early universe still inhabiting your body, finding it is nearly impossible. And the same holds true of entire galaxies and clusters. They are so complex, so busy, with star formation, magnetic fields, cosmic rays, supernovae, and all manner of intricate physics, that we can't ever hope to disentangle the primordial conditions of the universe by observing them. But the voids are simple. The voids are empty. The voids are clean. The voids are boring. They have barely changed in billions of years of cosmic history. Though they have grown bigger and occasionally merged with their neighbors, all those processes are slow, careful, deliberate. The voids are therefore relatively unevolved when it comes to great cosmic objects. They provide the perfect window into the early universe. If you want to know what the cosmos was like billions of years ago, you can look into the voids. And because the voids are filled with dark energy, they also hold deep within them the ultimate answers to that vexing mystery. Even though dark energy is thought to suffuse every cubic centimeter of space-time, it's impossible to divine its nature inside of dense regions, like solar systems, galaxies, and clusters. There's simply too much other stuff, and all the associated complex dynamics that go along with that stuff, to figure out how dark energy works. But not in the voids. Voids are brimming with dark energy. They are laboratories where cosmologists can go to study the deepest workings of the dark side of the cosmos. And so, for decades, cosmic voids have languished in the shadows, a forgotten and ignored byproduct of traditional surveys of the bright objects of the universe. Their initial discovery was even ridiculed and mocked, as cosmologists didn't believe that the universe could possibly create such vast regions of absolutely nothing. But in the past decade, interest in cosmic voids has exploded, thanks to new techniques like the watershed to reliably find them within surveys of galaxies. And now that those surveys are broad enough, 
Cosmologists have more than just a meager handful of voids to study. They have thousands to catalogue. The European Space Agency's Euclid Telescope, launched in 2023, will conduct a massive survey, mapping the positions of millions of galaxies. Where the study of voids was once on the fringes of cosmology, the Euclid research team now includes a group devoted to finding cosmic voids within the survey and using them to understand dark matter and dark energy. The same is true for NASA's next flagship mission, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which also has a working group devoted to their study. And so with every passing year, the universe appears to be teaching us something important about the nature of voids. If we want to understand the deepest mysteries of the cosmos, test the limits of our theories, and find clever ways to push past them into a new understanding of physics, we must learn how to stare into the deep abyss. You've been watching the entire history of the universe. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.